Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about tuck pointing, and we'd like to thank How's That For Fast for giving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. In the U.S., we call repairing the mortar between bricks tuck pointing. Do but other the, people call it different things? So generally, it's called pointing. If you're Why putting, pointing? You're using the point of a mason's tool to push mortar in between the bricks. Are you just making and, that up? <laughs> and then if you're repairing damaged mortar, it's generally called repointing in the, in the rest of the world. But in the U.S., we call it all everything tuck point because it's easy we're kind of lazy and and we don't use metric either (laughs) so the original term comes from england in the 1700s so hey they had these bricks without uniform edges and the mortar joint between the bricks would vary and it wouldn't look very uniform Mm -hmm. so what they started doing is using a mortar the same color as the bricks to set them all in place and then they would go back and cut a narrow groove into that wide mortar joint Mm -hmm. and then they'd use a mortar in a contrasting color to get this just straight even looking lines Hmm. so it just looked great but in the 1800s in chicago Mm -hmm. masons started calling pointing so finishing off the mortar joint and repointing both as tuck pointing And so in the U.S., it just stuck. (laughs) So I titled this episode Tuck Pointing. We're just going to be talking about repointing, which is replacing the mortar that breaks down over time between the bricks on the outside. So shouldn't you just label it repointing? (laughs) No. No one will listen. In the U.S., no one will listen to it. But we have episodes titled Opossums, Light Bulbs. (laughs) Yeah, those are great episodes. (laughs) Ants. So, so the mortar between the bricks on your home, it's intentionally softer than the bricks. So as your house settles or the bricks expand and contract, the mortar joints are going to crack rather than your bricks. Mm-hmm. And then the mortar joints are also allowing moisture absorbed by the bricks to be released. And this is going to protect the face of the brick. Oh. And this is especially important if you have an older home. Mm-hmm. When repointing your home's bricks, you need to match the age of the bricks to the type of mortar you're using. And the mortar needs to be softer than the bricks. How do you do and that? So if you have a home that's pre-1890, or at least if the bricks are pre-1890, these are primarily would, made... Would you know that? <laughs> yeah, if you have the whole home that old, you're going to know. So not 1900, no. 1890. <laughs> yes. So pre-1890, these bricks are primarily handmade after 18... So 1900. Okay. They're pretty much mass-produced. They're harder. They're more uniform. And some pros are recommending a type O mortar. So this has a 350 PSI. It's very soft. And most pros are recommending this for homes that are between 1890 and 1930. Hmm. What about bricks before 1890? So for very old homes or historic homes, a lot of the pros are using a type K mortar. And this only has 75 PSI, and that's going to protect these handmade bricks. And if you have a historic home, it probably makes sense to have a pro come out and they'll analyze the bricks and the existing mortar hmm. and they're going to suggest what blend you should be using. Okay. So the most common type of mortar for repointing walls and chimneys on homes after 1931 is going to be a type N. It has a 750 PSI. It's considered medium strength. And for most projects, this is going to be a good choice. If you're in an area prone to earthquakes, though, for these projects, you're going to have stronger brick, and they're using a type S mortar, and that has an 1,800 PSI. Okay. And if you're uncertain about the mortar, I would call the local village inspectors to see if they have a recommendation for the bricks and the mortar in your area. Do the letters actually stand for anything? So each letter is going to have a different, so how many pounds per square inch. Okay, the, but couldn't it be A, B, C, D? Or one, two, three, four? <laughs> yes, soft, medium, and hard. <laughs> so these mortars are for non-load-bearing brick walls. You have a wood-framed house that's carrying the load, and the brick is just your exterior siding. Okay. And most of the homes in the U.S. with brick exteriors are non-load-bearing. But I would always check, if you aren't certain, check with the building inspectors. In the UK, for example, brick load-bearing walls are going to be much more common, and not only do you need to use a high-strength mortar, so you've got to get something like a Type M, which is 2,500 PSI, another nice letter. Mm -hmm. And for a load-bearing brick wall, you should really have a pro look at it because if there's a lot of deterioration, I mean, now your house is in trouble. (laughs) Mortar is primarily a blend of Portland cement, lime, and sand, but it can have other ingredients to make it easier to work with, or it increases the air content. Is this something you're mixing yourself? 
Yes, yes. So primarily you're going to have a dry mix. You're mixing it with water mm. and you're whipping it up. And some are actually designed to kind of hold air bubbles and that helps absorb brick movement. Mm. So pretty interesting, all the different formulas. Some masons call mortar mud after the first mortars made out of mud and clay. So the ancient Egyptians were using mud and clay around 2500 BC as their mortar when they were building these buildings. The ancient, like the pyramids? Yeah, yeah, yeah those <laughs> buildings. And the ancient Greeks and Romans started using lime and hydraulic cement from volcanic ash as their mortar. So hmm. very strong. To replace deteriorated or missing mortar, you're going to clean out the area, remove any loose mortar, and I would start at the back of your house or on the chimney to practice removing <laughs> the old mortar. And then when you're repointing, mm -hmm. I would also start in an inconspicuous area in like case in somebody you, else's house. Yeah, in case you make any mistakes or you just need <laughs> to practice. To remove cracked or crumbling mortar, you can use an old slotted screwdriver or a chisel if you just have a few small areas to work in. I would wear leather gloves, goggles, and a dust mask, and a cold chisel actually works very well for mortar. They heat treat these for hardness and durability, and they're actually designed to shear nuts and bolts. So it's called so, a cold chisel, but it's heat treated. Right. <laughs> so a lot of people want to use a masonry chisel. Do I even want to know what that's for? So, so a masonry chisel has a dull edge and is designed for cutting bricks in half, or, or you know, cutting them in sections. Okay where a cold chisel is going to have a much thinner profile as a very sharp edge and this is going to allow you to work very close to the bricks to get the mortar out very cleanly but you have to be careful not to come in contact with the brick especially on older homes mm -hmm. and when you're using a cold chisel most pros recommend using a ball peen hammer because a traditional hammer you can chip or crack the face the face of what the face of the hammer itself because when it comes in contact with that chisel, or a lot of people just like using a mini sledgehammer for chiseling. Hmm. For large areas, you can use an angle grinder with a four or four and a half inch diamond blade for mortar, and this is great for horizontal joints. You'd want to wear a long sleeve shirt, goggles, a dust mask, leather gloves, and hearing protection if it's over 85 decibels. Hmm. And you know you can get earmuffs now with Bluetooth or built-in radios? Yes, everybody knows so, that, Jason. <laughs> Really? Yes. I thought these were the coolest. Yeah. So some top-rated earmuffs. DeWalt has a pair, and it has a built-in AM-FM radio. 3M has one that's MP3 compatible with an AM-FM radio. And the Honeywell Sync has Bluetooth for music, and you can also answer your phone. Wow. Exciting. If you're using an angle grinder to remove the mortar between the horizontal joints, make sure that you're staying centered right in between the bricks and just cut a uniform groove in between them. Don't try to get too close to the bricks. Once you cut your groove, then come back with a chisel and remove the mortar above and below the brick, anything that's loose. You definitely don't want to hit the brick with your grinder blade or the chisel. And then for the vertical joints, just use a chisel because it's just too hard to get into those vertical joints without grinding into the face of the brick. For large projects, you can use a rotary hammer with a chisel tip. And What's a rotary hammer? So a rotary hammer is like a drill, and what's nice about this, this is really designed... So not a hammer. <laughs> no, but it's... De <laughs> so it's designed for masonry. It you're, You put a masonry bit in this, it spins, and it has a pounding action at the same time, so it cuts through masonry very well. What's nice about a rotary hammer is it has a setting where you can just have the hammering action. So if you put a chisel tip on there, mm -hmm. it's very easy to go through mortar. And Bosch, B-O-S-C-H, they've got a mortar knife for a rotary hammer for the vertical joints. It's mm -hmm. an angled blade that goes right through the mortar and it prevents you from damaging the front of the bricks. Mm. And when you're removing this mortar, you're just removing the loose and damaged areas and then square off the area so it accepts the new mortar. For most projects, you're only going in a half an inch to three quarters of an inch. The mm. maximum amount you'd want to go is about an inch to an inch and a quarter. Any more than that, and you can actually weaken the area, especially if you're doing a large amount of mortar removal. <laughs> you can use a tarp or a drop cloth below the area you're working on to catch debris. And then once you've cleaned out the old mortar, you can use a brush and then rinse off the joints with a garden hose. That might be so hard on your roof. So, so if you're uncomfortable with a, a garden hose on your roof, you I can... I think everybody should be uncomfortable. <laughs> you can just use a spray bottle. So, so clean out anything loose. But we want to make sure that the, the mortar and the brick are damp because when we put the new mix in, if it's not damp, it can pull the moisture out of our mix. Okay. And you also don't want standing water because that can weaken the mortar also. Hmm, tricky. And, and when, if you're washing down a wall, you'd start from the top and wash down to the bottom. 
Once you pick your mortar, you may have to color it to match the surrounding mortar. And for most mortar colorant, you're going to be mixing the color to the water that you're going to be mixing into the dry mix. What? So, <laughs> so you want to color the water that you're adding to your dry mortar to mix it. And where are you mixing this? So you can mix it in anything. You can mix it in just a uh, one-gallon bucket, your water, or a five-gallon bucket. And, but it's important that you know the amounts. So the colorants are going to come in a liquid or a dry mix. And to get a great color match, you're going to need to spend some time making small batches. You want exact measurements, and you want to allow these samples to dry on a surface. So grab an old piece of plywood or some wood. Why do you sound so excited uh, so, about this? <laughs> well, I just did some small repairs on the house I'm in now, and they have a buff color to the mortar. So I'm trying to match this, and I started doing some small areas in the back of the chimney because I figured I was making my measurements, but it looked pretty good on the ground. And then I got up on the roof, and I patched it, and I allowed it to dry, and it turned pink. Hmm. So, I, so I had to keep adjusting it till I finally got the color right. And once you get your formula, I would keep that. So for future repairs, you've got that formula so you don't have to do all this experimentation. And the water that you add to your mortar is very important. You want to use the recommended amount, and the mortar should end up with a peanut butter consistency. For small repairs, you can mix your mortar in a one or five gallon bucket. For larger projects, you can use a concrete tub or a wheelbarrow. And I spoke to Lee from Sacrete. He's their technical expert. He said only mix enough mortar to use within an hour. If it's hot or windy, only mix enough that you can use in 30 minutes. And don't add extra water to make it easier to use as it stiffens. So this, this is going to weaken the mortar. Hmm. So if it gets too stiff to work with, just throw it out and create a new batch. You can work in temperatures from 40 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Use a clean container, clean water, or your colored water. And then add a small amount of water at a time as you're mixing it. Make sure you mix it thoroughly till it's a peanut butter-like consistency. Or he said it can also be like pudding or oatmeal. <laughs> so the, to, I'm going to have to find food pictures for my Twitter account this <laughs> week. <laughs> so it should really stick to the trowel when you turn it on edge. You want this to stick to a small pointing trowel without dropping off. So you're scooping it up and you want it to almost be sticky so that you're not, you know, slop. You can't have it too runny because then you're going to slop it over the face of the brick. Okay. To mix small batches, you can use a trowel or a stirring stick or a small hand shovel. For larger batches, a shovel or a hoe. And you want to mix the mortar for at least three minutes to five minutes so it's fully blended. And then you're going to allow it to rest for about 15 minutes. And they call that slaking, so S-L-A-K-E. And this allows all the dry components to absorb the moisture. There's also a chemical reaction that's going on. Hmm. But check the label for the recommended rest period for your mortar. Some companies are recommending a longer rest period. After your mix rests, it's going to stiffen up, so you're going to have to re-stir it very well, and then it's going to loosen up and get a very smooth consistency. Don't add any extra water. And then you're going to use a brick trowel or a hawk. So a brick trowel is a wedge-shaped trowel. You can turn this upside down, and this will allow you to hold small amounts of mortar so that you can tool it easily into the joints. The mortar hawk is a square piece of metal or wood, and it has a handle coming out of the bottom on the center. Okay. You know why early masons called that tool a hawk? No. Because they said it looked like a falconer holding a hawk on his hand. Hmm. So falconers are training yes. birds of prey to hunt small animals and bring them back alive to the trainer. Hmm. Isn't that wild? There's still falconer clubs. It takes two years to finish falconer apprenticeship. And it takes seven years to become a master falconer. Who and knew? And it's been around for thousands of years. <laughs> Some people think the ancient Egyptians were the first falconers. Exciting. Before you start putting mortar into the joints, you want to mist the area down with a spray bottle so the brick and the old mortar is damp. Mix your mortar and put some on the back of your brick trowel or your hawk and work a small section with your pointing trowel or a caulking trowel. So this is a thin trowel, the width of the joint, usually three-eighths to a half inch wide, and you're going to force the mortar into the joints. You want to match that trowel to the width of your joint. I would line up the hawk or the brick trowel to the joint, or you can rest it on the lip of the lower brick, okay. or you can leave it just away from the brick. And if you have the right consistency to your mortar, you should be able to scoop up a small amount of the mortar along that pointing trowel. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the height of the joint or the trowel, and it should stay on that as you push it into the joint, and you want to pack it in firm. 
For the vertical joints, you're just going to be using the tip of the pointing trowel. And for gaps that are in half an inch to three quarter inch deep, you can fill this in one application. For deeper gaps, pros recommend filling it in at least two layers and allowing about 20 minutes between layers. Hmm. It's going to prevent it from cracking. And take your time to line up the tool and force the mortar into the joints without getting any of the mortar on the face of the bricks. Right. The horizontal joints you're filling are called the beds, and the vertical or perpendicular joints are called the perps or the Why head joints. Need names. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to pack in the mortar to the depth that matches the existing mortar and after about 20 to 30 minutes you're going to check the firmness of the mortar that you packed into the joints when it's firm to the touch and they call this the thumbprint test you're now going to use a finishing tool to create that finished shape of the mortar joint so this tool is called a jointer or a slicker and you want to match the size of your joint and this looks like a caulking trowel but it's shaped and the most common shaped joint in the U.S. is concave, so it has an inward bevel. And this is very effective at keeping out rain and allowing evaporation of moisture in the brick. And it's very easy to tool or shape your joint. Mm -hmm. You can have a V joint, so this just has a concave V shape. A weather joint is slanted or angled down to the lower brick. The top is in further than the bottom. Flush is just flush with the brick face. You can have raked, so this is usually about a quarter inch deep gap and can have a rough edge from the tool or a nail that's used to create the gap. And the more decorative joints where the mortar extends past the brick can actually hold water and cause damage to the brick over time. Really? You don't want to wait too long to finish your joints, so the mortar needs to be firm but not hard. And pros recommend tooling the vertical joints first and then the horizontal joints around it, going back and forth to get a nice uniform look. Mm -hmm. You want to work in small areas. Just mix enough mortar so that you can work an area 30 to 45 minutes at a time. Keep your tools cleaned off and knock off any mortar that you get on the brick face. And I would have a wet rag and a clean bucket handy while you work so you can remove any, anything on the face of the brick. Mm -hmm. And then work your joints with the joiner from the top down to prevent debris from getting into the finished joints. You want to keep your mortar from drying out too fast. Don't work in direct sunlight on hot days if possible. And pros recommend a light misting. Once you're finished tooling it and it's firm, mist it three times a day for three days. Hmm. You don't want any rain for the first 24 to 48 hours. And 30 minutes after you've finished your joints, now you can brush this with a soft brush at a diagonal to knock off any small debris on the face of the brick or the mortar. Hmm. Some people like to fill the joints with a mortar bag rather than using a brick trowel and a pointing trowel. What is so, it? so this looks like a cake decorating bag. Hmm. You mix your mortar, you fill the bag, and then you push the tip of this bag into the joints you squeeze the bag and you fill the joint, then you come back and pack it down with a pointing trowel. Have you ever used this? No, no, never have. Hmm. For mortar with only a couple of holes or small areas that need to be filled to prevent water from doing more damage, you can get a mortar caulk. Hmm. So these come in a few different colors or you can get clear to blend in with the surrounding mortar and these are waterproof and paintable, but you don't want to use these in large areas because we want the joints to breathe. Hmm. Some top-rated caulks for mortar. Red Devil has their masonry and concrete caulk. It comes in a gray color. Sashco, S-A-S-H-C-O, has their Morflex, and it's M-O-R-F-L-E-X-X. -X. Mm. <laughs> and this comes in gray or beige. Sacrete has their mortar repair. It comes in gray. And Lexel, it comes in perfectly clear. Mm. If you have loose bricks, what you can do is remove them and then knock off most of the big chunks of mortar because it's going to make it much easier to replace it and old mortar doesn't stick well to the new mortar, but be careful using a cold chisel not to crack the brick. Mm -hmm. You just want to get off the big pieces. Clean it, rinse it off, rinse off the area. You don't want any standing water, but it has to be damp. In that space, you're going to apply a bed of mortar just a little bit thicker than the joint that you're going to finish with. You're going to put mortar on the edge of the brick, the side that you're tucking into the opening, and then put mortar on the top half of the brick, the side that's being pushed in. Mm -hmm. You're going to slowly work it back and forth, work it into position. You can use the bottom of your trowel to tap it so that it's square in place. And then with these large gaps, you're going to apply the mortar in layers. So fill it about halfway full, wait 20 or 30 minutes, Put the second half in, pack it down good. Mm -hmm. Once it's firm to the touch, right. then you're going to finish off your joints. Hmm. 
A couple of the top rated mortars you're going to find in most hardware stores, Sacrete, S-A-K-R-E-T-E, and Quickrete, Q-U-I-K-R-E-T-E. Do you have anything else to add? If you have a brick home, your mortar joints are going to break down over time, so this is a great skill to develop. And I would have a routine of checking the joints every year. It's going to keep the repairs small. It's going to be easy to maintain. And mm -hmm. this is going to add a lot of life to the bricks and the surrounding mortar. And if you're coloring your mortar, I would take the time to create small batches, allow them to dry, perfect your formula, and then save that. Keep it somewhere. Unless you like pink. <laughs> I would check your brick chimneys, especially in cold climates. That freeze-thaw cycle can really break up the mortar over time. And you mm. can easily save a big expense, mm -hmm. or at least you're going to add a lot of life to your brick and your mortar by repointing it when there's gaps. Mm -hmm. Type N is a good all-purpose mortar for homes in the U.S. after 1931. But if you're uncertain, I would talk to my local inspector or call a pro. Let's wrap this up. There's only a few more things we have to add to book four before we get it to the editor. Oh yeah, we are working really hard on that. <laughs> I put my name first, by the way. <laughs> you gotta get it when it's free because the last three books, my name was first, Cindy put her name first on this book. Yeah, well, from now on, I if, guarantee you. If you're interested in subscribing to the podcast, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, the Google Play Music app, iHeartRadio, and CastBox. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, <laughs> Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can check out our books or download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com and follow Cindy at fixitpodcast on Twitter. Fix it co-host. Fix it co-host on Twitter. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Talk to you next week.